Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami Last week, someone asked a question about what to do when there were distracting sounds. And after the gathering, someone told me that they'd lived in an apartment where the neighbors upstairs were raucous uh, most of the, or some of the night when they were meditating. And for a while, the person would just imagine that there was a little, uh, child version of Thich Nhat Hanh running around upstairs. So maybe people can just imagine Thich Nhat Hanh up there kind of ringing the heating system. And I might talk to Skinner about that, but I thought that was quite good. So some of you might have seen, we had this wonderful interview with uh, a doctor, uh, PhD, um, named Marjorie Woolacott two weeks ago on Wednesday around near-death experiences and rebirth. And someone asked a question in the chat at the very end, um, do animals have near-death experiences? And I thought that, that's a wild card, but let's, let's ask it. And uh, surprisingly, uh, Dr. Woolacott had something similar to an answer at least, where she said there'd been a recent study on end-of-life lucidity in animals. So these moments towards the end of life where a sudden lucidity comes over um, someone and, or an animal and there's a clarity that's been absent. Um, and the story she shared from this research paper was a dog who'd been lying for weeks sick on its bed in the kitchen, dying. And then one evening, when the family was at dinner, it got up and it went around the table and shook the hand of every person there, and then it went back to its bed and died. And there's a phrase that is well known in Buddhist circles that the Buddha taught uh, a teaching in the numerical discourses where he said the mind is radiant. The defilements are, it's just tainted by passing defilements. Pabasarang chittang, chitta is heart, mind. Pabasara means radiant. Akandu kehi kile sehi, it's tainted by visiting defilements. In another sutta he says, that one practicing well illuminates the world like the moon freed from clouds. In the Dhammachaka Bhavatana Sutta, the first discourse, he talks about this series of knowledges, insights into the Four Noble Truths. And he says, vision arose, knowledge arose, light arose. This is dukkha. This is the cause of dukkha. This is the cessation of dukkha. This is the path to the cessation of dukkha light arose. And when he speaks about the enlightened mind, the most clear analogy he gives throughout the entire canon, because whatever the enlightened heart is, it's beyond words, but the word he does bring, uh, or the phrase he uses to describe the enlightened mind is light that lands on nothing. And this movement from darkness to light is everywhere in the suttas. And it mirrors our experience. We, as one practices, not only in a meditation, when the mind grows calm, there is what we call the light nimitta often arises, the sense of radiance. But the world becomes brighter. Um, there's uh, Ajahn Chah, I believe, said that one can measure one's practice by the fact that as one progresses, 
the number of things that make one suffer decrease and the number of things that make one happy increase. And the central movement in, and you can see it in people's faces after practicing this radiance. So the central movement in Buddhism in this practice is the switch between feeding off of the world like fire feeds off fuel with an agitated, dirty burn, a uh, flickering flame that's bound to what it feeds off of, which reduces things to ash, to the energy of light, which is cool, radiant, and blesses what it touches. And this can take a while to, to make the transition because light is gentler, and often there's a period of waiting where you've given up that heat of the fire and it takes a while till your eyes adjust to see light and to have patience and care for yourself through that process. So the mind is radiant, colored by passing defilements. And I, I think that I just referenced the dog story because it's a great story, but also uh, for me, it, it sort of illustrates this clarity of mind that comes even when the blockages are removed. And so this is, a, when we look to the practicalities of practice, this metric of light is important to look to, as are the elements that darken and obstruct the mind, the visiting defilements. And the Buddha spoke of five, what he called the nivarana, which means something like blockages or to lead astray, um, the hindrances we often call them. And these are the hindrances to calm. These are what darken the mind and keep us from coming home um, in the sense of coming home to the heart uh, and that sense of refuge and recognition that is so prominent when one touches again the experience of being centered and calm and peaceful and bright without feeding off of the external world. And these nivarana, uh, there's kamachanda, which is sensual desire. There's vayapara, which is aversion. There's tinamita, sloth and torpor. There's uh, utacha kukucha, which is very fun to say. And that means restlessness and remorse. And then there's wichagicha, which is skeptical doubt, the type of doubt that circles again and again like a dog chasing its tail. And the Buddha gave analogies in Majjhima Nikaya 39 for these. He said, one freed from sensual desire, kamachanda, uh, or one in the grips of sensual desire, it's like a person who taking out a loan, um, who's taken out a loan and has to pay interest. And when one is freed from sensual desire, it's like a person having paid back the loan. Uh, one freed from aversion is like a person who is sick, ill, unable to enjoy their food and tired, suddenly freed from sickness, freed from illness. Anger is an illness. Tinamita, one freed from sloth and torpor, is like a person who'd been trapped in a dungeon, dark, suddenly freed from imprisonment. One freed from restlessness and remorse is like a person who's enslaved, unable to go where they want, subject to their master's bidding, suddenly freed from slavery. One freed from skeptical doubt, is like one who, taking a caravan through a desolate land, unsure if they may gain passage, having passed through. And the mind freed from all five hindrances is freedom from debt, freedom from sickness, freedom from a dungeon, freedom from slavery, safe passage. When the five hindrances go into abeyance, the mind becomes glad 
when the mind becomes glad, rapture arises. When rapture arises, ease arises. The mind at ease grows calm. The calm mind sees clearly, and uh, knowledge and vision of awakening arise. So that sounds great. <laughs> That's the radiant mind. Wouldn't that be nice? So there's a phrase, a, a quote, that if you want to teach people to sail, don't, you don't have to teach them to, to build the ship. Make them love the ocean. That's nice, and it's why Rumi books grace many a bedside table in America, as do Mary Oliver books. But Buddhism's power, it is in learning to love the ocean, in the sense of remembering again what we are here for, what awakening means and its possibility. But the power of Buddhism and the Buddhist teachings are its practicalities, the fact that it gives us a way to build the ship. We know we want to be better. We know we want to find a way past these hindrances and be loving. And yet here we are uh, at various degrees of, neur degrees of neuroticism and suffering, and that's the situation. And What's so powerful about these teachings is they are these practical means of here's how you build the ship. So how do we meditate? How do we actually sustain a practice? And meditation, the heart of this practice, um, is problematic in how it's often been taught in the West because often it's simply taught as find the breath, or a meditation word, and just place awareness on that and stick to it using active will to return, and eventually something will click and you'll find clarity and uh, hopefully enlightenment. But Ajahn Lee, uh, a famous teacher, said, look, there's two kinds of minds in the world. There's the minds that think very little in which case this approach of one word or one point can really work. And I think in much of history, people growing up in uh, hillside villages, the pre-modern era, they had this mind which was easily unified. There's a story of Ajahn Mahabua, just uh, a famous teacher in Thailand, deciding just to keep the word Budo going for a week or multiple weeks straight until he suddenly achieved samadhi, and it worked for him. And I know about 50% of monastics I, I, I have met read that, and we're like, all right, we're going to do it. And uh, I, remember, I remember going to Ajahn Anand, my teacher, and saying, all right, I, I read this. I'm going to give it a go. And he said, good luck. And, and after two days, I was just absolutely miserable. And most of people in the modern era, we have the other kind of mind. We think a lot. This is the other kind. And this doesn't mean we're hopeless. Ajahn Chah said that people who have this kind of thinking proclivity, it does take us a lot longer to clean out the house. But once we've cleaned it out, we have a big house. So we're not hopeless. But it does mean we have to learn how to work with that thinking mind. If we just try to bring it to one point and focus on an utterly kind of simple, mundane object again and again through act of will, um, it's a lot like taking a classroom of second graders and just telling them to sit down and be quiet right off the bat. And it doesn't often work. Rather, we have, and that desire to do, to move, to think becomes. Uh, moves to a subliminal level and it clenches everything up. This is why when people are just like trying to just follow the breath and not control it, often the breath becomes tight and constricted. So what we have to do is work with our proclivity to think, um, to channel it. And concentration, unification of mind is, uh, the concentration is a problematic translation because it implies a focus on one point but unification of mind can imply a sense of unified purpose, and the mind can actually be fluid and spiral into a calm. It's different. And the 
research, I mentioned this a few times ago, research has pointed to three kinds of, you know, that there are these three kinds of, uh, at least, uh, awareness that one can cultivate. There's spotlight, which is placing awareness on one object. There's lantern, which is this broad accepting awareness. And then um, there's a third kind of awareness that reads very differently in brain scans, and that's play awareness. And play awareness is fluid, it's interested, it's interesting. And that's the type of awareness we want to bring to mind in concentration, in meditation. It can include the other two, but it's playful and engaged. And if the meditation can be playful, lighthearted, interesting, then the mind will want to remain with its object within that my, uh, foundation of mindfulness because it's interested. So a really useful paradigm for those of us who think a lot is to think about meditation as cooking. And most people here are going to want uh, two objects at least, a primary and a secondary, rice and curry. The Buddha, there's a sutta called the Sutta, uh, sutta where he compares a practitioner to a cook. He says, just as a cook would take note of their master's preference and adjust the dish to suit them, even so, a practitioner focusing, abiding, recollecting body in the body, feelings and feeling, mind and mind, dhamma objects and dhamma objects, the four satipatthana, sees their mind grow calm and takes note of that. But a foolish practitioner does not take note when placing awareness on following or recollecting the body in the body, feelings and feelings, mind and mind, dhamma objects and dhamma objects. The mind does not grow calm and they don't take note of that fact and their mind is not unified. So we don't want to be fired as cooks. We need to take note of what our mind likes. And so what's a good dish? The Anapanasati Sutta, uh, Mindfulness of Breathing, is a really good kind of basic scaffolding for finding your approach to meditation. Um, and Mindfulness of Breathing is a great rice dish for everyone, um, almost everyone. So that can really be the kind of um, primary object, uh, or at least your grounding object. And it can really help initially to just let the breath kind of center you. And you'll always want to, even when you foreground another object, because as you have these two objects, one you'll want to foreground sometimes, and then other times you'll want to background it and foreground the secondary. So. You have the breath, and then choosing an appropriate secondary object, your curry. And often this will be a bit more spicy, a bit more flavorful, and you can alternate it and switch it. Um, so a really reliable secondary object for people is metta, loving kindness. And this can just be a gentle sense of friendliness um, brought to the meditation. And most of you know how to cultivate loving kindness. You bring up recollections of people you care about, um, of the squirrel in the tree outside. That's one of my favorites. Uh, just wishing that they're warm for the night. Whatever kind of gets the glow of metta going in the heart. And this is a good secondary, broad. Another good secondary is the nada sound. Um, that's this subtle hissing uh, or ringing below the auditory landscape. It's very easy to miss, but if you give awareness to it, you'll be able to, over time, pick it out probably more and more. And if you give attention to it, it becomes quite loud. Uh, Ajahn Amaro can hear it over power tools, and it's grounding and brightening. If you need to put earplugs in to pick it out, that's fine, but it's like a good friend. It's a very broad secondary object. And a third secondary is a broad awareness of the body. So this is something uh, like we were cultivating in the guided meditation where you do a body scan through the entire body and reacquaint yourself with that wider field of the body. And then even if you come back to one point, like the breath at the nose, 
or the belly or the chest, you have this peripheral awareness of that wide scope of the body and there's less of a sense of claustrophobia. It's the difference between coming into a room, a dark room, and sitting down in a chair curled over on yourself, like that's a bit like just coming straight to one point of the breath versus first doing the body scan, which is where you uh, kind of walk around the room, clean out the cobwebs, open the windows, turn on the lights, and then sit in the center. And then, so you've done the body scan, you've circulated, and then you come to the center, and the mind is sort of broad and bright. It's a different feel. So this can seem like a lot, but it's useful to play with and to realize that the secondary objects, you'll notice they have this quality often of brightness, of breadth, and of more active mental engagement. And as you progress through the meditation, you really might find that those secondaries merge. Um, initially, maybe you do the body scan and then come to the breath at the center, but with this peripheral awareness. But then you might find that the nada sound sort of arises on its own, or a sense of love kind of arises on its own. Um, and that's okay, these things merge, because in a sense that secondary object, you're resonating with the luminous mind, and the luminous mind has the quality of clarity, of breadth, of loving kindness, and of light. So as the mind begins to unify, all those things will come together, and you'll be breathing, or maybe you'll be breathing. Well, you will be breathing, but <laughs> hopefully, um, unless you've reached fourth John, in which case you won't. Um, but uh, at the same time, there will be a sense, perhaps, that you're breathing almost love or light or metta. And light is the other secondary object. As the mind grows calm, you might really notice this sense of brightness coming. And people miss it because they look for, it's called the light nimitta, they look for one ball of light, but rather often it's this whole brightening of the visual landscape. And any of these secondaries, these curries, if you give awareness to them, they'll strengthen. Awareness uh, energizes what you give it to. This is the power of appropriate attention, yoniso manasikara, is it gives energy to what it, it gives attention to. The issue is that if you only have a secondary and don't have the breath, things can get very vague and ungrounded. So you want both. If you're foregrounding a secondary broad object like loving kindness, uh, you're gonna want the breath kind of in the periphery. And you don't always have to, it's really hard to split awareness um, at the same time. But have faith that if you foreground an object, say you're foregrounding the breath, but just, it can be 90-10, maybe 10% somewhere in the back. Every now and again, check in with your secondary. Is there a sense of friendliness and loving kindness? Do you have some sense of the wider body? And then after you've been with that primary object for a time, you might find the mind grows tired of it. And that's when you bring the secondary object to the fore and background the primary. And Maybe at that point you do a more active cultivation of metta contemplation or focus on light or do a body scan, a circuit around the body. And that will keep the mind engaged. And the mind may go back and forth and back and forth between a broad and narrow object until they merge. And you suddenly find that you're at your home base, your center point, following the breath at one spot but somehow also aware of this whole broad field of the body and awareness, and that's your center. So this is how we cook uh, for meditation. And it's worth noting that as we mix this dish, um, first we're trying to cultivate joy, rapture, what we call pitti in uh, Buddhist thought, P-I-T-I. -I. It means also refreshments. It, it's refreshment. It's etymologically related to the word for drink. And it's this sense of if you hit on a good object, it'll be like you're soaking up something. You've been so hungry. Most people have this experience very commonly with metta, is you 
find that loving kindness is growing and you find you are so hungry for it, there's something so sustaining, and that sense of kind of soaking in that sense of loving kindness is pity. And in the sequence of mind states the Buddha talks about, uh, pity, rapture, cascades into samadhi, which cascades into clear seeing. It's the transitional factor between actively bringing, cultivating a mental object, and then once rapture, this sort of sense of joy has arisen, the meditation can cascade much of its own, and the mind will begin to grow calm. But we're cultivating that insor internal source of wealth and joy. And you might also find that sense of pity is more the sense of kind of nourishment from the body's breath energy. Um, in Buddhism, breath isn't just the air at the nose. It's uh, a sense of energy moving through the body. So as the mind's calm, if you try to your, do a secondary object as a body scan, try imagining roots digging deep into the ground and drawing up nourishment from deep below with every breath. And you should send this deep, earthy, nourishing energy. And then place awareness up above the head, and there should be the sense of bright, sweet light. It's a different sort of energy, but let that happen, and then merge the two in your center uh, at your kind of home base. You're merging heaven and earth. This is pity, too. It's quite noisy. <laughs> and <laughs> Thich Nhat Hanh. <laughs> so the, uh, the other thing to note is that the Buddha gave us good ingredients for this culinary exercise and concentration. And there's three kinds of sankara in Buddhism, um, at least in one use of that term. It's an extremely variegated term. But sankara means formation or activity. And the Buddha spoke about how there's uh, vachi sankara, which is verbal activity, um, how the mind talks to itself. There's citta sankara, which is perception and feeling. So images, things like that. And then there's kaya sankara, bodily activity. And that's um, the sense of the body. And so you want to, these are your ingredients. So what this means is you have to find which one is your favorite. What does your mind like? Um, some people are very visual. So if you're visual, maybe the way you bring up metta is by using a citta sankara, uh, mental activity, a perception, so a memory. Can you think of someone you love gazing at you? Can you imagine an act of giving? Uh, can you imagine the person you're trying to spread metta to uh, on their, uh, holding their hand on their deathbed and then holding their hand as a five-year-old? These are images. Can you imagine a warm, loving flame in the heart of metta or light? Or maybe your mind is more inclined to vachi sankara, verbal fabrication, verbal activity. So what's a phrase that works for you? Love, love, forgiveness, friendliness. It's okay. You're doing fine. What phrase works? And then there's kaya sankara, which is bodily fabrication. And that's just, can you bring your mind to the heart? Not the actual heart, but sort of the center chakra, the station of consciousness of the heart. And just let awareness of metta grow right there. And you can do that with um, any of these meditations. With the body scan, if you incline towards visual, you can imagine the breath as this white mist coming in and out of the body or flowing down the spine. Or you can uh, count the breath. One, one, two, two, up to 10. And then do it again, up to 10. But if you're more visual, maybe you just want to imagine the numbers. Write them in light. One, two, three. 
And you can combine the two, like imagine the numbers where you want to place the breath. One, one, two, two, or at the heart or at the ground. And this is just how, or just come to Kaya Sankara, bodily fabrication. So place awareness where you feel the breath most prominently and become sensitive to it. That sense of coolness when you're inhaling and relaxation when you're exhaling. Invigoration, relaxation. So this is how we play. Ajahn Jeff's fond of saying, you don't learn about eggs by just staring at an egg. You make an omelet, you make a fried egg, um, you, make, you throw eggs at people, do, do, different, <laughs> do different things with the eggs. And this is playful, but what we're doing is cultivating joy, and as we do, we learn about our mind. And the progression you're looking for is a steadily, steady refinement of the mind towards brightness, a simplification. Initially, you might find your mind's very active, you're doing a body scan, you're switching to metta, you have a phrase in mind or an image, but the mind steadily sublimates. It becomes bright and simpler and clean. And things settle down. You find that, say with metta, you only need to drop in a word every 60 seconds and then you just let it ring. And then another 60 seconds later, you drop in the word love and just let it ring. Whereas at the beginning, maybe you have to be doing a lot. Maybe you have to be, you know, using a long phrase and saying it again and again. But what you want is that steady growth in a bright, clean backdrop of the mind that simplifies and refines. And this sense of brightness growing, of internal joy. And that internal wellspring of well-being is what we called, called Niramisa Sukha, which in Buddhism, there's a happiness of the flesh, which is all the happiness we gain from the sense, the cords of sense desire, things we consume, tastes, touches, feelings, um, sights, sounds, etc. And this is fragile because the world will not always give us those things, and it's coarse. And then there's Niramisasukha, spiritual happiness. And that's the happiness that's internal the happiness of the radiant mind that slowly grows and it's refined, but it's not fragile. When the body breaks, when we're on the deathbed, if we get paralyzed, if our spouse doesn't behave the way we wish they behaved, we still have that. It's an internal resource. And we go about our lives loving the people we love, um, caring for the duties we need to care for, but there's a sense of levity because we're not dependent on them. It's like someone who f wins the lottery and they still go to their job to have something to do, but they won't take it too seriously. They'll never cheat. You know, they'll never lie for the sake of their job because they don't need to. And they have something to give. So this is what happens when we cultivate the bright mind. And it has a feature of knowing, of luminescence, of radiance. Yeah, I can't think of anything else to say. So, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> sadhu, 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 anumodan. And just to follow up a few little resor a few resources for sources for folks, for really good. Um, Instruction on Breath Meditation, a very good book is Breathing Like a Buddha by Ajahn Suchitto. And you can find that online, Breathing Like a Buddha. We may have some hard copies. Um, on dhammatalks.org, Ajahn Jeff's or Ajahn Tanisro's website, there's two books. Um, one's called Keeping the Breath in Mind and the other is With Each and Every Breath, all free. And those have uh, different breath techniques. The one we did this morning with the drawing awareness down the spine, that's called method two in, I believe, keeping the breath in mind. Um, for cultivation of the nada sound, the sound of silence, there's an online PDF called Inner Listening by Ajahn Amaro. So all those are just good resources for folks to experiment. And if you haven't tried to use the sound of silence, 
I would really recommend trying it. It's a very powerful object that people don't know about very often, so give it a go. So we have a chance for questions now. Um, if people would like to discuss anything, just raise their hand and we'll bring a mic over. And if you're on Zoom, you can type your question into the chat or raise your electronic hand. Hi, Ajahn Isabel, this is Scott. Um, how would the sound that you're talking about be different from like the tinnitus I have? <laughs> the tinnitus question. Yeah, that's, a, that's an old one. I've never sure. known the answer to this one. Who here has tinnitus? Yeah, a lot of people have tinnitus. Okay. I've asked this question before. I know one person who's begun to see it as a good friend, uh, the tinnitus, they changed their relationship to it. I believe it was Dory, is that correct? Um, so there's part of me that thinks that maybe people with tinnitus might be just really lucky in getting to have the sound of silence there really prominently, but I feel like everyone's going to be angry at me for saying that, and it's probably not true. So, you know, one can try, you know, maybe one can try to use tinnitus as a sound of silence and see if it can just be a grounding object. Um, but I, I'm also curious if, I think I know someone who has had had tinnitus and was able to pick out the sound of silence below it. Um, so you can experiment with that, but I'll be really curious. Um, I've been curious how people with tinnitus can work with it as well, and it may just not be an available object for you if the tinnitus is both unpleasant and always getting in the way of the nada sound. So I'm not sure on that one. Let me know, Scott, on that one, though. And people can talk to Dory, too, and see what she's done. Sorry for volunteering you, Dory. OK. <laughs> I can speak up. Oh, but for the Zoom folks. Ajahn Isabo, when you find your visual field or the mental field brightening, how do you focus on it without, because when we talk, you know, so many teachers who are interested, you know, teach the jhanas, deep jhanas, they're like, don't look at the nimitta, don't look at it, don't look at it, ignore it. But let's say your mind is just, like you describe, just brightening on its own, brightening with no, with no solid object. How do you split your awareness between the breath and this brightening field that has no center? And mm -hmm. also you're worried about kind of scaring it away. So, yeah, there's, there's schools of thought on this. And there's teachers like Rob Rebay and others who say the nimitta, which means literally sign of light, it's like a, a, a street light, you know, it's like it lets you know you're going the right direction, but you don't want to steer at the street light, so you'll just crash into the pole, and you know you'll lose track. Um, so I've heard that school of thought, um, and I've uh, I asked Ajahn Tanisaro, Ajahn Jeff about it explicitly, and he said Ajahn Fuang, his teacher, called that lightning of the visual field the uh, the breath, the light breath nimitta, or no, the light of the breath, and he said you can foreground it. So I suppose there's two schools of thought on it, and I think one has to experiment a bit. What I do find is that when the mind gets calm, you can, there's two qualities that are factors of samadhi called vitaka vichara, and it's directed thought and evaluation. And it's compared in the commentaries to ringing a bell and listening to its resonance. So kind of the applying intention or steering awareness and then stepping back and seeing what it, what it does. And I find that as the mind gets calm, you need to ring the bell a lot less because things are quieter. Um, so what I find useful when the mind is calm and say there is a brightening of the visual field, but you're also aware of the breath and maybe, um, you know, there's also a sense of metta or the nada sound is initially just dropping awareness into that and quickly noticing 
the breath, the light, like the breath and the light, say, um, and then releasing and just letting the mind circle into which one it wants to, to touch um, and just trusting that a little bit um, and seeing how it works. Like if you foreground the light too much, does it just um, let the whole experience kind of get fuzzy and dissolve, in which case that's not right. But I do find some of these secondary objects, like the nada sound, it's not like you're always coming back to them, but when the mind is calm, sometimes there's just this way that it has of dissolving a bit of tension. So the mind will like briefly touch into it and then it'll come back to its main object. Um, so I can't give too much of an answer except that I think when the mind's calm, you can trust it to know intuitively a lot more what it needs. And sometimes just acknowledging that a broad object like the light, it's definitely a permissible object, at least for the mind to touch briefly as a touchstone. And then if the mind really loves it and wants to go to it, and you find that it remains concentrated, then, you know, good. But, it, but if you find that the mind, you know, gets lost, then, then it's not to be perhaps cultivated in that way, so. But this is the aspect of play, like kind of seeing what works, like what dish, and the dish does change as the mind gets calm. You have to like figure out how do you work with the calm mind? How do you work with the more coarse mind? So. Thank you. Yeah, good luck. I'm just going to read something from... Uh, Please. Okay. <laughs> um, Mary, you can go next. Um, there was a comment. Uh, where did it go? Um, from Van Vandana. Not a sound for me is like when you watch a movie and they are showing dark night and there's no sound, but there's a subtle sound of silent which makes it which makes it not completely silent, but something is there to keep you interested in the movie, especially if it's a suspense thriller. <laughs> <laughs> suspense thriller. <laughs> That's good. Okay, and go ahead, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Ajahn. Hi, everybody. Um, before I just, I want to check out an understanding, but I want to give a shout out to whoever is providing the flowers. They have been so beautiful the last weeks. I mean, it really is a gift to see the rug, the flowers, the monk, the Buddha Rupa. It's really a gift. So thank you all. Yeah. Okay, and here's here's what I want to check out. This enlightened mind um, is a light that lands on nothing. So that implies to me that there is no object and there is no self. There's no self to perceive an object, and there's no object to perceive. A pause for thought. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, is that, was there more to do with that, Mary? That's No, that's I plenty. just wanna check out, I mean, it's a very evocative statement, Yeah. and I'm wondering how that can be, and it seems to me that anytime we perceive an object, we are a self, we are perceiving something. Mm -hmm. So if light lands on nothing, then... Mm -hmm. Yeah, a great question. Um, you know, first, the, the flowers are beautiful. And yes. <laughs> just so people know, uh, all this, you know, these are all skillful means, but uh, and they all these meanings, it's, it's a language of sim symbol that's been developed over millennia. So often we'll offer flowers, and that's... People know the Noble Eightfold Path is divided into three aspects of morality, concentration, and wisdom. And flowers represent morality, ethics, virtue, because mm. the Buddha said virtue is a scent that carries even against the wind. So flowers have a beautiful scent. Uh, mm. Samadhi, concentration, is incense. It's one-pointed. And wisdom, panya, is uh, the candle that provides light. So that's why we offer candle, incense, and flowers. Sila Samadhi Panya. And these are really nice. Thank you, Juanita and others. Um, as to light that lands on nothing, I've mentioned this before, but someone asked, looked at a carving by Michelangelo of a beautiful stallion he'd made out of a block of marble, and they said, how did you carve that stone into that uh, 
horse into that stallion and he said the stallion was always there I just had to chip away what wasn't the stallion and that was very much the Buddha's approach is letting go of what we're attaching to and then what we come to when we've let go of that he called Nibbana but he left largely undefined because it's beyond words and as soon as we name it too clearly it's very almost inevitable that we take it as a self and you see this problem throughout traditions of uh, the Buddha's teachers got caught in it um, and so when he talked about Nibbana he really spoke in terms that are hard to make to completely lock into a logical framework um, there's a famous sutta where Vacha Gota says where does does one who attains enlightenment after death do they exist and the Buddha says does not apply so Vajra Gota says do they do they not exist and the Buddha says does not exist does not apply Vajra Gota and just to cover all the bases Vajra Gota then says do they both exist and not exist and the Buddha says both not exist and exist does not apply and then just to really finish it up, Vajraguta says, do they neither not exist nor not exist? No, do they neither exist nor not exist? And the Buddha says, does not apply. And Vajraguta says, I have, basically, I have no idea what you're talking about. And the Buddha says, this flame, would you say it's de burning dependent on fuel? And Vajraguta says, yes. And the Buddha says, when it goes out, would you say it goes to the north, south, east, or west? And Vajraguta says, North, south, east, and west do not apply. When it goes out, it's simply reckons, reckoned as out. And then the Buddha says, even so, Vachagota, that material form by which one trying to identify the Tathagata, the word the Buddha used for himself, would identify him, has been cut off like a palm tree stump, not subject to further becoming. That feeling by which one might reckon or label the Tathagata has been uh, cut off like a palm tree stump, let go of not further, subject to further becoming. That perception, that mental formation, that consciousness. He goes through each of the khandas, the things that we take as self, and he says each of these is no longer relevant, and these are how we define a being. And so basically he's short-circuiting all of our conceptual thought and saying look it's beyond conception what happens to the mind but it's not nothing and I think that's the beauty of the light that lands on nothing statement is yeah he's saying the only way we perceive beings is by their cr attaching to and alighting on one of the khandas um, on these bodies everything but when you remove the attachment to that, what's left, it's not nothing. It's radiant. It's beyond time. But it's utterly beyond reckoning. So, you know, this is something, I don't know a, a kind of Buddhist who hasn't tried to get their mind around this. And the Buddha just said, look, it's beyond thought, so just keep letting go into that. But I think that metric of light, of spaciousness, and the assurance that when one lets go of what one's clinging to, you're not left with a cold blankness, but rather a radiance that's all pervasive or something like that. That's the closest the Buddha gave us. And what a beautiful thing to circle around and move towards. So did that not answer your question in the right way? I think we do have to wrap stuff up. So um, let's read the uh, chanting of...